Chapter 16 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape, Chapter 16 The Raging Beast. Although once mighty Ophridia of Tarth, and certainly the nations of Earth, had outstripped Bylanus world in the physical science, the planet of the pink and green suns was supreme in biology. Thus had it needed Portok's help, a hundred Earth Tarthian years before, when run-down entropy threatened its very existence. On the other hand, through biology, the science of Bylanus' world had come a long way in the conquest of death and destroyed human tissue. So it was that with some faint ray of confidence, Bylanus brought the two broken bodies to the single large city of this park-like planet. There, tenderly, he left them in the care of the specialists at the regeneration station, and began his long vigil. Sensation and movement. Hardly anything at first. Bram Forrest dreamed of dreaming. The motion was gentle, warm, comfortable. The glow of life and not the cold breath of death. With it, with the first stirrings of regeneration, came the shadow of pain. But it was far away and almost impalpable, pain understood rather than felt. And slowly the pain departed. There came a time when Bram Forrest realized he was not breathing, was indeed immersed in liquid. He floated, helpless, serene, strangely content. Until, with the first signs of impatience, strength flooded through his regenerated limbs. In every cell of a living creature's body, Oro the biotechnician explained to Bylanus, there is the potential for complete and perfect regeneration. For whereas the eye is an organ to see with, in every one of the millions of tiny cells making up the eye is the gene pattern, not merely for the eye, but for the rest of the body. Theoretically, then, Bylanus, if we are given but a single intact cell of a living or once living organism, we ought to be able to reproduce the organism in its entirety. This is not supernatural. It is not creation of life. We can create nothing. The secret of creation is not ours here at this laboratory, but we have mastered the secret of recreation. Nurtured by the life-giving fluid, their development controlled by their own genes, the two human beings you brought are being made whole again. Bylanus nodded. Oro, the biotechnician, was loquacious and spoke quickly, confidently, with mild pedantic enthusiasm. As for Bylanus, he awaited the regeneration of the man who had worn Portok Savior's bracelet. He looked at the bodies in the vat, hanging upside down, floating head down, rocking gently in the warm, circulating life fluid. He waited. Bram Forrest took his first breath. The first thing he said was, Ilya! Ilya! Bylanus met them after the vat had been drained and a door had opened for them. He told them what had happened, including the death of Hultax. Then he added, As far as I am concerned, there can be no doubt as to your identity. But the bracelet is lost forever, and there will be some who doubt your identity. Abruptly he seemed to change the subject. How do you feel? Good as new. Bram Forrest said. He was naked. He was tingling with health and well-being, as if he'd awakened from a long, health-giving sleep. He looked at Ilya, her skin glowing, her hair gleaming, her glorious body a shining promise. Then he frowned. Bylanus' words took meaning. "'You want me to fight the boar of the Cranuian wood, is that it?' "'Yes,' Bylanus said. Bram Forrest shrugged. Coming here was not my idea, although Portok somehow realized it would be so. Slay the Cranuian boar, proving your identity without question, and all the golden apes will be yours to command. Yes, but did Portox really feel I must wreak upon Abaria and the Abarians the same destruction they brought to Ophridia? If I destroy Retok the Abarian, responsible for what happened a hundred years ago, wouldn't that be enough? I don't need the golden apes for that. 
I can do it myself. I must do it myself. Tarth, said Bylanus, is a world of warring nations. But here on the planet of two suns we live in peace. We are strong, but know not the meaning of war. Is that what Portok's savior wished for your people? Perhaps, Bram Forrest said. Then, Ilya told him, speaking for the first time, even if you slay Retok, his legions will not willingly give up their arms. Bram Forrest nodded slowly. The idea of a Tarth-wide holocaust did not appeal to him, but if all Tarth could be shown the folly of war when its most powerful army went down to defeat before the Golden Apes. Thank you, Bram Forrest said humbly to the Golden Ape. He had a vision, almost mystical, of a time in the future, perhaps the near future, when all Tarth knew nothing but the ways of peace. When we return on the River of Ice, we want you to accompany us. I'm ready to meet your boar. Ilya held him. Tears glistened in her eyes. Bram Forrest, she said tremulously, now that I've found you, I don't want you to be hurt ever again. Bram Forrest responded, Don't worry, Ilya. If Portox had known I'd be more than a match for the boar, he never would have established its conquest as proof of my identity. But, but don't you see? You've been regenerated, as Bailana said. You may not be as strong as you were. Bram Forrest looked at Bailanus, who shrugged. Bailanus lifted them when Bram Forrest nodded. The park-like terrain flashed by. A dark forest loomed. The Cranoean wood. Close at hand, an animal screamed. How do I look, Proclium? Volna asked her seneschal. He bowed before her. You are lovely, O oh my queen. Volna smiled. She wore the royal purple of Nadia in a gown which fell, clinging as if sentient and voluptuous, to the wonderful curves of her body. I am not your queen yet, she said, laughing. A mere formality, my queen. I am Volna. Virgin Princess of Nadia, sister to Bontark the King. Ha! Huh, snorted the old man. That is your official title, but what do titles matter? When this day ends, you will rule all Tarth side by side with Retok the Abarian. Yes, Volna thought, with Retok the Abarian. But how long would that alliance last? Would either of them be content to share power with the other? Wouldn't there come a day when she would give the nod to Proclium, and the legions would march against those of Abaria, chanting, All power to Volna, all power to Volna the beautiful? The thought of power, power over strong men, over leaders of nations, made her giddy with desire. All the royal blood of Tarth was gathered in Nadia City now, for the funeral games. She knew Retok's plan. Her spies had confirmed it. Retok's legions would slay the rulers of the multiple nations and clans of Tarth, and one by one, stunned, leaderless, the small nations would flock to the banners of Abaria and Nadia. If, then, Retok had in mind to betray her and claim all power for himself, her own legions would be tested and ready. And Bontark, she thought? What of Bontark, her brother? As if he could read her thoughts, Proclaim said, I have arranged the list for the dueling which will end the game's majesty. Bontark, as you know, expects a duel to the first blood with some competent whip-swordsman. Proclaim licked his thin, dry lips. He will be confronted instead by a duel to the death with Retok, the best swordsman of all Tarth. To flee would mean cowardice. The army would then be loyal to you, majesty." To remain and fight would mean only one thing. Death, said Volna softly. She could hear the legions. The legions seemed to chant in her ears, All power to Volna the Beautiful. She thought of the day's funeral games. Games for the memory of Jalomek the prince indeed. They were games for her, for Volna. 
they would be a party celebrating the rise to power of Volna, virgin princess of Nadia. But, of course, neither Nadia nor Bontark, its rightful ruler, knew that yet. And when they did, Retok and his legions would make sure they could do nothing about it. The games would be a feast, Volna's feast. All power to Volna. The Cranuian boar came screaming from the forest. Its small, close-set eyes found Bram at once. If it had seen Bylanus and Ilya, it ignored them. Four hundred pounds of muscle and sinew, it made stomping and pawing for Bram. He sidestepped nimbly, saw the massive head go down, felt one of the wicked tusks brush his thigh with fire. He stumbled and almost fell. If he fell, he would not rise again. The boar would finish him first. Bram Forrest! Ilya screamed. He got up and grasped the tusks. He was dragged along, furrowing the ground. The huge head snorted close to his own. The boar's breath almost made him gag. Then, before the boar could smash him into a tree trunk, he let go and rolled over and over and quickly stood up. The boar did not wait for him to regain his breath, but came charging at once. This time Bram Forrest waited until the last possible instant before the tusks would impale him. Then he leapt, twisting around in air. It was a prodigious leap and brought a word of exclamation even to Bylanus' lips. He landed on the hard-muscled back of the boar and at once clamped his knees firmly against its sinewy flanks as if he had been trained all his life for this job. The boar reared and bucked and swung its great body from side to side, trying to dislodge its tormentor. But Bram Forrest clung as if all Tarth depended on the outcome of this contest, as perhaps it did. The boar ducked its head. Bram Forrest fell forward, but his knees locked. The boar rolled over, but moving so swiftly that the eye could hardly follow him, Bram Forrest squirmed out from under and was seated astride again when the boar got to its feet. Then, leaning forward, Bram Forrest grasped the two tusks and began to pull the boar's head up and back toward him. The animal's screaming became squealing. Slowly, the head went back. The short, almost non-existent neck strained, the beady eyes darted. Then there was a loud snapping sound, and the boar squealed once and fell over on its side with a broken neck. Bram Forrest, panting, the muscles of his legs quivering, stood clear. Bylanus touched his great golden head to the ground. Ilya ran to Bram Forrest and flung her arms about his neck. "'I was afraid,' she said. "'I was so afraid you would be hurt.' Bram Forrest kissed her. She clung to him, sobbing his name when their lips parted. Finally, Bram Forrest disengaged himself and said, "'The poem, Ilya. We've seen an ape, a boar, a stallion.' This world is the land beyond the stars. But was the boar also the raging beast? Ilya shrugged. Bylana stood up and told Bram Forrest, The golden apes are ready to serve you in any way you wish. Three worlds, Bram Forrest thought. One which Portox had saved from doom. One which had been the haven in which Bram Forrest had grown to manhood and one in which all their destiny soon would be written. Then Tar thanks you, Bram Forrest told the golden ape Bylanus. Assemble your fighters. We are going back up the river of ice. To Nadia City? Illy asked. Bram Forrest nodded grimly. To Nadia City and Retok. Bontark, king of Nadia, asked his royal guest, you like the game so far? They sat with Princess Volna in the Box of Honor at the amphitheater of Nadia. I, I like them, Betok said slowly. But, sire, I would like them much better if they were not to commemorate the passing of your noble brother, the Prince Jlomek. Bontark nodded his head in gratitude. That was well spoken, Retok, he said. Retok went on. Have you any idea who killed him so treacherously? Jlomek was not a fighting man. 
None, Bontark admitted. He missed entirely the smile which passed between Retok and Princess Volna. Well, Bontark said after a while, if you will excuse me, I must go down below to prepare for the dueling. Under the circumstances, I'm hardly inclined to participate in the games, but my people expect it of me. Yes, brother, Volna said softly. They do. Oh, they do. And Bontark went. Retok looked at Volna. I'd best get ready myself, he said. Volna nodded her lovely head. A bloodlusting animal cry welled up from a hundred thousand throats as the gladiators of Nadia marched out across the sands of the amphitheater to do battle with the fierce snow sloths of the plains of ice. While several jecks from the gates of ice, Retox legions waited. Wait here, Bram Forrest told Bylanus, who had led them safely, along with the vanguard of the golden apes, back up the river of ice. What will you do, Bram Forrest? According to Ilya, we can trust Bontark of Nadia. He's a fighting man, but he craves peace for all Tarth. I'm sure of it, Ilya said. Bontark didn't send us to the place of the dead. Princess Volna did. And long ago, according to the stories the wayfarers of Ofrid tell, Bontark and your mother, Queen Avala, were allies striving to establish universal peace throughout Tarth. Besides, despite his civility and fairness, Bontark loses no love on Retok of Abaria. And if you need us? Bailanus asked. We'll get a signal through to you, Bram Forrest said. With Ilya, he climbed into a skiff and pulled it out into the river. Now the river banks were deserted, except for the solitary stilt birds, tall as men, wading out into the frigid water, their low-pitched calls all but swallowed by the sound the cold wind made rustling through the river rushes. After a while the skiff came to a bend in the river. It was the last turn before the gates of ice and Nadia City. Here the wind blew more strongly, and there was a section of rushes which had been cleared, cut probably by an ice-field's nomad who had used the tall rushes as fuel. Look! Ilya cried suddenly, startled. Through the gap in the rushes, at a distance of two or three jecks across the flat plain from the river, Bram Forrest saw an armed encampment. There were tents with flying standards, tethered stads, pyramids of stacked spears like hayricks, and pacing sentries. "'What can it mean?' Ilya asked. "'Those standards are a barian.' "'Retok,' Bram Forrest said. He lifted the pole and felt the mud of the river bottom cling to it before it came clear. He allowed the skiff to drift toward the bank. "'Retok's planning treachery. We'll have to go back and alert the golden apes.' Bylanus and his apes can destroy Retox legions before they even march on Nadia City. But we can't go back, Bram. If Retox's army is here, ready, then what's happening in Nadia City? Who can say what Retox is doing? You'll have to go ahead and stop him, or at least delay him. I'll go back for Bylanus. Bram Forrest shook his head. I can't let you go alone, Ilya not with the Iberian Legion so close. But I must, don't you see? Bram Forrest frowned. There did not seem any other way, but he was reluctant. I love you, Ilya. I couldn't let... What happens in Nadia City today is more important than our love, Bram Forrest. What would our love mean if Retok the Iberian ruled all Tarth? Then you take the skiff. Bram Forrest said finally. I can make my way to the city along the bank. No, the army is still encamped. They won't do anything for some time yet. See, all their tents are still standing. That was true enough. Besides, Ilya went on, we don't know what Retok is planning in the city. You can reach it faster by skiff. I'll go back for Bylanus on foot." The logic of what Ilya said could not be refuted. With sinking heart, Bram Forrest helped her from the skiff. He kissed her quickly. I love you, Ilya, he said. 
And I love you, Bram Forrest. Be careful. Keep hidden in the rushes. Tell Bylanus to use his judgment in attacking or waiting for Retox legions to make the first move. Ilya's pretty head nodded. Then she ducked into the rushes and was gone. Bram Forrest looked after her until the rustling in the rushes stopped. Then he pulled the skiff once more out into the center of the river and sped swiftly toward the gates of ice. No one stopped him. No guards were posted. He beached the skiff and sprinted through the gates and through the city and up its biggest hill toward the amphitheater. Then, only a jack's distance away, he heard the crowd at the funeral games. They roared suddenly, in a frenzy of excitement, and another part of Portox's poem slipped into place. The crowd watching the games in Nadia City was the raging beast, bloodlusting, expectant, animal savage, whipped into a fever of goggle-eyed enthusiasm and ready to move, en masse, in whatever direction a strong leader might push them. A strong leader. Retok or Bram Forrest? Which one? Piram the Iberian shifted his weight uncomfortably, leaning down on the haft of his spear. The whole idea of posting pickets along the bank of the river seemed unnecessary to him. They could not actually see the river through the rushes, and they dared not go closer for fear of being spotted by whatever traffic moved on the icy waters. Then what was the point of them standing here, half frozen with the cold, waiting for an assailant who would never come? And while he was thinking thus, the girl virtually walked into Piram's arms. At first he heard a faint rustling in the rushes, and before he could investigate, the tallest of the dry plants had parted and a lovely, bronze-skinned girl appeared. She turned to run, but Piram caught her in his muscular arms and held her despite her struggles. She bit his arm, and with an oath he caught her hair and twisted her head back. "'Who are you?' he said. "'Who are you, eh?' The girl glowered at him. Piram dragged her along. She continued to struggle. Shaking his head, he hit her on the jaw with his fist and caught her before she could fall. Then, swinging her up over his broad shoulder, he stalked through the rushes toward Nadia City. End of chapter 16